I've invited you here today because I believe that we as CEOs, business leaders, and owners need and deserve the best decision-making tools available. When I was running my business, I had a great management team as well as access to really good advisors and they served me well. But often, I was the only senior executive in the room and everyone else needed something from me. Job security, salary, approval for projects, a fee, and at times left me feeling lonely and isolated. And the stress, quite frankly, took its toll. What I really needed was support, thought partners where I could bring my questions, noodle through ideas and opportunities, almost like my own personal board of advisors made up of people like you where everyone in the room was a business leader and no other agenda than to help me be more successful. I host a CEO peer advisory group in the tri-state area in partnership with Vistage. And to me, this is what Vistage is all about. It's a safe place to go with other senior executives who are from non-competing industries and together offer hundreds of years of experience to talk about ideas, opportunities, and challenges getting different perspectives and insights, all with the goal of helping each other make better decisions. During our monthly meetings, there are typically two key agenda items. One, we have the opportunity to learn from speakers who are experts across various topics. And the other is our executive session where we process issues, share ideas and perspectives on critical topics. Today, I'm thrilled to introduce you to Amy K. Hutchins. Amy Kay is one of our top Vistage speakers, who also is a Vistage member for over eight years. Amy Kay travels the globe sharing her, sharing with executives and influencers how to confidently and competently navigate their toughest conversations without saying something they regret, giving their power away, or damaging their relationships. She's an international award-winning speaker and a master communicator. After our discussion with Amy, you will have the opportunity to hear from some of my members on why they joined Vistage and what the day in the life of a Vistage member looks like. Thank you for being part of this introduction to Vistage. Hi, Amy. Thank you so much for your time today. It's such a pleasure to be able to get to know you over the last few months. You're thoughtful, you're funny, and maybe the most energetic and inspiring person I've had the pleasure to meet. I love okay, Margaret, following you. Pleasure now, right? No, oh, I, I love following you. And, 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 you know, and I'm sure by the end of this conversation, you're going to get so many more followers as well, because even without having a real dialogue, I can feel that energy and inspiration. So it's, it's, oh, you just made my heart expand. Thank yeah. you. I do. I do love what I do. And I consider that a privilege. So thank you. Well, it shows and it shows through video, which is amazing when I'm just watching you and it's not even a real person, but you know, <laughs> face to face. So anyway, I know we have limited time today, so I'd really love to jump right in so the viewers can get as many pearls of wisdom from you as possible. Awesome. So, you know, I'd love to start with some statistics that I have heard, um, which surprised me a little bit. One is 80% of executives resist leading conversations they dread. And the other is one out of 10 admit to avoiding tough conversations for more than two years, which is crazy. Yeah. So these are obviously terrible numbers. Can you provide some insights into why leaders are so fearful of having these tough discussions? Well, you, emph you emphasized admit, which I think is probably that you nailed it. I think that there are more than one out of 10 that are like, oh yeah, I've avoided a tough conversation. And I think, I think there's a lot of reasons, but I think that the two most common ones are that we're not even sure how to get it started. In other words, we're not even like, like how do I even approach this difficult topic? And then the second is a concern that it's not gonna go well and we're not gonna improve the scenario or we're not gonna get what we want. So between not knowing how to have the conversation and then being a little bit in that mode of trepidation that it's gonna make things worse instead of better, we avoid it. And then here's, here's kind of the crazy thing anecdotally, cause I've been coaching for 25 years. Mm -hmm. A lot of the senior executives that I talk to will say, oh, I had such relief after I had it. Like I finally got through, like, why didn't I have that sooner? And that to me is the other statistic, which we talk about, which is the number of leaders 
that are dealing with emotional duress from not having the, the conversations that they need to have, whether it's the stress, the frustration, the anger, the lack of performance and productivity, which truncates their ability to grow their, their business, get the team that they deserve. I mean, the ripple effect goes on and on. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to have a, an effective culture if you're not providing real honest feedback. Um, yeah. And I think, I think a lot of times too, we've been burned by some of those conversations. So we kind of know what that ick is. So like, for instance, if I had come to you, let's just say three years ago, we'll just make this up. And I had reamed you out and I had not handled a difficult conversation really well. And you left feeling less than, or like somebody had like taken your power away or you felt um, diminished or dismissed, then that's going to make either you more hesitant to go have a difficult conversation, or you're going to go have it and you'll model what you experienced. So it'll be not such a great conversation, or you'll do the opposite. You'll just be like, I don't ever want to feel that way again. And so you never have a tough yeah. conversation. And I think that it's really important for us to remember, it's just a skill set and we can all get better at it. You know, so with that now is, you know, that time of year, that people are starting to think about or starting to conduct year end reviews. So, um, you know, what, you know, year end reviews, setting goals, um, and just getting off to a fast start, what insights can you share on how they should go about doing these? You know, how do they prepare for possibly difficult conversations? And is there a timing consideration they should be thinking about as well? All, all of the above. So let, let's just kind of unpack that a little bit. One of the things that I think that it's so important is that you do prepare. So in real estate, I joke, they're like, location, location, location. You know, in, in leadership and tough conversations, I'm like, prepare, prepare, prepare. And mm -hmm. it's not about scripting. This is really important. I've been doing sales training for a really long time. This is not about scripting. I don't believe in scripting because then you're not listening and you're not fully present. Like you're just trying to get through your script. What I do love, though, and appreciate are back pocket brilliant one-liners that can put guardrails around a conversation, course correct. And yes, timing is everything. So I think it's important that if you've had something happen and you are off, you know, your, your game is off or your energy is off, that is not the time for you to have that conversation. And you would be better off saying, hey, something unexpected happened. This conversation is really important. I want it to have my full attention and focus. Let's reschedule. Now, that's a very respectful way of saying I'm here and I'm committed. I'm not deprioritizing you, but I want to reschedule. The other thing that you can do when you walk into somebody's office or you're meeting somebody and you can sense that they're off or they're clearly communicating to you that they're agitated about something else, not the conversation itself, but just life, then you can say, hey, this conversation is really important. It matters to you. It matters to me or it matters to us or it matters to the client, whatever you're talking about. And then say, let's just reschedule because you got a lot going on. And that's, that's just a way of giving somebody grace if something else is distracting them. Now, if they're just nervous about having the conversation, I think it's really important to set that tone of, hey, this is a really important conversation. And our job is to make sure, or my job is to make sure that we have a successful outcome or that we set you up for success. So you can do a nice little stroke of compassion, which is just empathy. The other thing that I want to highlight is that when you start with a question that's engaging, that leans into connect, you're setting the tone and tenor and the framework from the start. So it's kind of that classic, hey, Margaret, we need to talk. And you're like, Doo! you know, you get all defensive. But if I were to send you an email invite, or if I were on the phone with you, or we're chatting, or I send you an email and say, hey, we need to talk, it's going to get nervous, right? You're going to get defensive. But if I say, how might we make you a more successful leader on the team? How might we make you a more integrated, successful team player? How do we set you up for success in the next 90 days? That's a conversation that you're going to want to go to, that you're going to want to attend because it's forward focused and it's positive. And I think that that's a great way to start a conversation is with a positive sort of framework like that, not Pollyanna, but just that optimistic realism of we're not going to have this conversation um, just because we want to hear ourselves talk. We actually want to have some type of positive and productive outcome. But also, as I'm listening to you on that, it sounds like it's more of an approach of how do we versus you did this, you didn't do this. It's it's really trying to, as you say, that empathy, but working together toward a goal. Um, well, it's the psychological play, and I use that word purposefully, of saying that we're going to co-create a better future together. 
So what most of us do, I think, I think, I think anybody listening can relate to this. What most of us do is we get upset or we get annoyed, we get frustrated. And then we're like, well, it's not that big a deal. And we put it off. And then it kind of happens again. And we're like, oh, that's now it's kind of validating that I was irritated before, but we still don't have the conversation. And then by the time that we do, when it happens the third or fourth time, we lose it. We're, we're just, we're so fed up. And, and whether that's with our kids or with a coworker or a direct report or a board member, we sort of, we lose our cool. And so what I love is take that deep breath. You mentioned a lot of conversations that are happening at this time of year. Take the deep breath and say, what do I want as an outcome? of this specific conversation. So what's my intention? What's my overarching, how might we question, which is by the way, a magical phrase, how might we fill in the blank? How might we grow our sales by 12%? How might we make you a more integrated, successful team player? How might we close the deal? How might we shorten the sales cycle? Whatever it is. And then create an agenda of two or three more questions that really um, force the people that we're talking to or the individual to elevate their critical thinking. And that's, that just leads me into a couple of magical phrases if you want to go there. Because I would love to go there. Phrases. So I, I have two right now that I think are really effective in a tough conversation. And that is at the end of a tough conversation, you need action, right? We're all looking for changed behaviors. So if you're just like, oh, thanks for your time, Margaret. It's like, no, that, that's, that doesn't make the brain work. So what I want to do is I want to either offer to do something myself request something from the person that I'm talking to or the people that I'm talking to, or both. I'm going to go do something and they're going to take an action as well. And if you're not sure that you're going to get buy-in, let's give that person a sense of autonomy and control. And so I use the magical phrase, would you be willing? And then I give them what I call guided choices. So a guided choice, let's just be fun for a second. So if we were at home, I might say to the teenagers in the house, I might say, would you be willing to set the table for dinner, unload the dishwasher, or feed the dog? They don't really want to do any of those things, right? But I need them to invest, and I need them to engage, and I need them to be a successful part of the family dynamic. So when I say, would you be willing, now I'm giving them a choice. I'm not just like, you need to. And by giving them guided choices, I'm much more likely of their own volition to get them to say yes to something and feel committed to doing it than if I just give them one choice and they have the opportunity to say no. So all of a sudden, you know, that kid will say, oh, I'll unload the dishwasher or I'll feed the dog. And you're like, yes, one down. Two it's to go. all within. You're still controlling that conversation because those are. Are all the things, those are the things you need to get done. It's just uh, putting it away that they feel they're in control as well. Absolutely. And it works at, at, in the in the professional environment as well. So suppose that I report to you and you say, hey, Amy Kay, would you be willing to um, draft, you know, the proposal? Would you be willing to set the appointment with the client for next Tuesday or Thursday? Or would you be willing to do some of the research on this? And I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll set the appointments and do the research. Like I can get both of those things done. Then, then I feel like I'm in control of my choices. Yeah. Um, and again, you don't always have to use guided choices. You could just say, hey, Amy Kay, would you be willing to start draft one? And I'll be like, yeah, I would be willing to do that. Then, you're, then I know people who are listening are thinking, yes, but what if you say, would you be willing? And they're like, no, I'm not willing. Then you're getting information. And you're getting information that allows you to lead empathically to say, well, what would you be willing to do? Or help me understand, I'm sensing resistance, help me understand the resistance. Either way, you're leaning in to connect, to give them a chance to explain themselves so that you can better understand them. And that's how you lead, right? By, by communicating to connect, we have these conversations that have far more profitable outcomes. What I also love about, it, especially this last thing that you're talking about is there is, I think, a fear. I think about it with myself sometimes, like, oh, gosh, what if they say this? Like, what if they say, you know, would you be willing? They say no, right? It's like, oh, my gosh. But in fact, as you said, it's a data point and it's just a conversation. So, it, it you know, OK, so why not? Or, you know, go from there. It's just uh, there's there's no downside. Um, there, there sometimes is, but we you have forget to feel that. confident. And that takes practice. Yeah. Confidence is not something you read in a textbook, right? And so that's what I love about the magical phrases and why I use them so much and I share them so much is because it just gives you a sense of like, oh, I can face this conversation. Like I can get through it. So let's, wa let's walk through that one. That's a great example. Suppose somebody says no and you're like, okay, I wasn't expecting that. Say that. Yeah, that's, a that's what I'm saying. Acceptable What's thing the word? It's like, oh, right. I wasn't expecting you to say no. What's yeah. the thought behind it? That's your magical phrase. Right. What's the thought behind it? 
And then you feel like, oh, I can get through this, which by the way, is another magical phrase. So let's unpack another one. Most of us will- I wish, you, I, I wish you had a book on all oh, of I, this. I, oh, I do. I do have a book. <laughs> but but we've, got to, we've got to pull all these together because I got hundreds. So one of the things that I love about the magical phrase is that it's going to move it forward. So if if somebody says um, you know something that, that you don't want, or let's say- Okay, let's back up for a second. Let's let's do one where because I, I was going, I got two different thoughts. Suppose you're ready to do a low level critical thinking comment, which is like, oh, you're going to be fine, or oh, it's going to be fine. What I'd rather you say is, you can face this. Mm-hmm. You you've got this. You find your tone, your your tenor. But I like the words, you can face this. And when appropriate in a personal context, it's not telling somebody that they're going to be fine if you don't know that they're going to be fine. It's about saying, you've got the resiliency, you've got the grit. I know that you've got the courage and the strength to face this. And again, when appropriate, you could say, and I'm here to face it with you. I love that. And that's a much more beautiful and supportive comment. Then you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. Oh, it's all going to be fine. Because people don't feel like you actually are seeing them. That you're understanding them. They feel like you're discounting them. Yeah. You know, if you say it that way. So yeah, I, that's a really... I just wrote that down. <laughs> I think that's a, lovely. And, yeah, and so yeah. now I'll date myself. I'm 51. I have no problem admitting that. Sometimes when I go into a tough conversation, especially if it's in the Zoom scenario, I will put post-it notes around my laptop or on my laptop, reminding me that this is an important conversation and that my words are only going to do one of two things. They're going to hurt or they're going to help. Mm-hmm. And that's a really great thing to remember that in the moment you're allowed to be human. You're allowed to have a reaction. You're allowed to be triggered. Your, your reactivity doesn't define you, but your response does. And so if somebody says something egregious or inappropriate or blindsiding, just taking that deep breath and being like, all right, how do I choose to respond to this so that I can move forward in a helping way or at least not escalate the tension and the angst and get closer to what we want that's good for both of us? That's leadership right there in real time. Yeah. You know, so just to follow on on that, because I agree, I think it's a really important point. There is at times going to be something that you say that you regret, right? Or a view that, you know, you've given the power away or damaged a relationship. How would you bounce back from that conversation? So an apology and a a really well-worded one not, I didn't make, it didn't, I didn't intend to make you feel that way. It's not an apology, right? So it's owning it. But here's, here's the thing that I'll, I'll say with everybody. When you apologize, there's a whole spectrum of, oops, my bad to, hey, I owe you an apology, right? There's that whole spectrum. The other thing that I want to share with people is that it's never too late. So if it was yesterday, if it was last week, if it was two weeks ago, if it was two years ago, You have every right to go back and say, I owe you an apology. I wished, and you might, you might feel this way. I wish I'd given it to you two weeks ago, but I now realize and, and, and I, and it won't happen again. Right. So, so you're moving into that type of thing. The other thing is it can be minor. So I'm, I'm guilty. And it's, this is funny because I call myself a master communicator, but I'm also guilty of saying something just stupid right? Or the words come out wrong. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's like, we all do. And that's why I asked that question. Absolutely. We all do that. And so what I'll often do is I'll own it right then and there. So it can be as simple as, you know, I just, I just said the wrong thing. It was like, I completely gave you the wrong answer. It's like, Margaret, redo. Eh, You know, that is not what I just meant to say. What I meant to say was, or what I, what I wanted to say was, or what I should have said was. And so I just own it right then and there. And sometimes Sometimes words come out and we blurt them. And then we can either find humor. We can make fun of ourselves. We don't make fun of others, but we can make fun of ourselves. So like the other day I said something and it was completely wrong. And I said, you know, I don't know where that came from, but that came from my exhausted brain. So, you know, it's like on a scale of one to 10, that was like a 10, a 10 of awkwardness, right? My, my bad. And you move on. But here's the funny thing. The faster that you own it, the faster you allow everybody to let it go. Yeah. So they're not harping on it or talking about it after, quite frankly. Right. I mean, that it's the water cooler conversation. That's really great. And, you know, it's it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to, you know, 
express her feelings. And I think sometimes people don't, um, don't feel comfortable doing that. And I think just all the things you're talking about is we are just humans. It's having a really human conversation. And we're getting better at it. That's, that's the fun thing. You know, every, every generation brings a challenge and every generation brings a solution. And I feel like the last couple generations have made it far more acceptable to talk about the way that we feel and the thoughts behind that and how we got there. I mean, my, my parents' generation was mad, sad, glad, right? So it was like, that was the, that was a spectrum of emotions that you would ever share. I'm mad, I'm sad, I'm glad, right? That's so funny. now, Now these kids will come in and they're like, oh, you know, I feel so sad that this, and and then I feel, you know, isolated and I feel, and you're like, yes, at least they're using other words. Like, you know, and, and of course you don't want them to feel this way, but they're expressing themselves at a more detailed, more extensive, emotionally literate vocabulary. And it's good for them. It's healthier for them. Yeah. It's also easier to dress because you have a better feel of what it is you're really thinking. And then you can ask questions for there. But you know what? That brings me to a point of one thing that I've heard from some of the CEOs in my group is how do you effectively communicate cross-generational, cross-generational? Oh, I'm sorry, Margaret. <sighs> I can't. <hear> that. <laughs> so I think, you know, one of the things that is really important is just changing the angst that we have about this. So if you're going to, if you're going to go to the whole, you know, that generation, you know, it's impossible then you're doubling down on your inability to connect with them. And so, yes, every generation is different. I mean, I, I joke that baby boomers were sort of like, you know, Margaret, don't make eye contact with me and I, I'll assume I'm doing okay. Whereas, you know, uh, baby boomers came along and said, I'd like feedback. My generation came along and said, I'd like quarterly feedback. You know, now now the 25 year olds, like if you could just text me that feedback, that would be great. Don't leave me a voicemail. I won't listen to it. So everybody plays differently. And yet, what do we have in common? Our humanity. What do we have in common? Our desire to be seen, heard and understood. Our desire to have connectivity, our desire to build relationship, to be affirmed, to be appreciated. And so I think that when you show up with the internal conversation of, I'm just here to be a witness to you and what you're experiencing. If you can respectfully be a witness to me and what I'm experiencing, we can actually have a really robust conversation. And one of the best ways to do that in your organization is to pair cross generations together on projects and ask them to get to know each other. Ask them to have the casual Zoom call or go for the cup of coffee and get to know each other. And if you think like, oh, that's too awkward, then give them a couple questions to answer. Like, what's one of the things that you're most excited in your life that you've already achieved? What's one thing that you're most excited about creating? What's something that makes you a little bit uncomfortable? What's something that you you love or who's somebody that you love, you know, spending time with and what makes it so special? You're going to find that you have more in common than you have differences. Well, and and hopefully over time, it can become a a, a mentoring with each other. Um, And and you're breaking down the barriers because you're getting to know someone who's older or younger. And, you know, hopefully some of those stereotypes go away as well. Yeah. And I think it's, I think it's gently calling people on the stereotype when they're said. So I I spend a lot of time with older individuals and and I I say that sincerely and respectfully because they're senior executives and they've spent a career and they'll, they'll get on a coaching call with me and they'll just be like, ah, you know, those young whippersnappers. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to call you on that. Is there a specific behavior that's upsetting you? Then let's figure out how to have a conversation to address a behavior. But if you're just going to do that, oh, they're so difficult and oh, they don't want to work and you want to be a part of the stereotype, I'm going to call you on it because the only life that it's making more difficult is yours. Yeah, that's that's good. I love the pairing. I think that um, could be a really effective tool to help deal with. I've seen some it work. Of those I really yeah. have. I've seen it work in a lot of places. Yeah. So just a few more questions, because I know we are, I just want to be cognizant of time. Um, you know, there, there's a few other things that I continue to hear. Um, one is, especially since COVID, there's the remote, you know, so sometimes, you know, you're not even seeing people face-to-face anymore, or you're seeing face-to-face via Zoom. So is there... Again, whether it's timing or trick in terms of giving critical feedback, you know, is it okay to do it? Is there something you need to um, 
shift in terms of your style when you're doing things more Zoom and more remote, more remote versus meeting together? Um, so that would be one question. And then the second one, which kind of goes with it, is culture has become so important and top of every CEO's mind. Um, and again, there's this concern about the balance of, well, if I have this nice culture, what's the balance of providing critical feedback? And could it really be part of that culture? Should it be part of that culture? There's just, you know, I know, I believe I know what the answer is, but that is something that comes up. We'd love to get your view on that. Well, I think, I think you just nailed it in the sense of, you know, I have this nice culture, you know, is it okay to be critical? Well, then what's the conversation in your own head that you can't give constructive feedback and do it in a way that actually makes you the empathic and nice leader? And so it's kind of unpacking your own internal story about what it means to be nice. So nice is not letting people fail. You know, nice, nice is not letting people get away with treating others disrespectfully just because you you're uncomfortable addressing it. So I think it's having that internal conversation with me, myself and I and saying, what are the behaviors and the values of the culture that I want to create? And then how do we respectfully communicate and treat each other in that? And so a lot of times it is sharing the vulnerability. So you could start with, let's just say I've, I've done something that's not a part of our culture and you're the leader and you have to come to me and you could say, we need to have a really important and hard conversation and just lead with that vulnerability. Or Amy Kay, we're going to have to have perhaps an awkward conversation, but it's really important to me and it's important to the culture that we have it. And so you're it's letting a good me word know to put out there exactly that awesome. excited about it. Yeah, I, that's a good word to put out there. So it's, and it's okay. I mean, I've, I've started a couple conversations over the years with, this is awkward for me. This is hard for me. And it's really important because it matters to us or it matters to the project or it matters to the team, fill in the blank, whatever's appropriate. But leading with the fact that this is a little hard for you, that's not a lack of leadership. That's actually showing up with your own sense of empathy for the entire situation. The other thing that I'll say that's really important too is that as humans, so much of our communication is tone and tenor and the energy that we bring to the conversation. I mean, we all know somebody whose energy doesn't match their words. You know, that classic, I'm fine, I'm fine. <laughs> you know, the words don't match it, right? So I think it's really important that in a Zoom dynamic, you realize that you are missing information from the other person, but the other person is missing information from you. It's why there's so much miscommunication in email. You make up your own tone. You make up your own tenor. You make up your own story of that energy behind those words. And so it's not about using more you know, emojis and exclamation points. That's not what I'm getting at. But it is knowing in Zoom that you might have to frame something before you say it in order to make sure that the intention, at least delivered by you, has a better chance of being interpreted correctly. So sometimes... I've even joked over the years, like I'll type, I'll type a question. And then in parentheses, I'll be like, and I type this innocently and sweetly, not the sarcastic version of these words. And like, you know, winky face so that people yeah. are like, oh, she's not being snarky on that comment. She literally wants to know the answer to that question. But you can do the same thing in Zoom. You so, know, if, I, if I were to sit here and, and suppose we were having a tough conversation, I could say, all right, we're going to miss some information because we're on Zoom. So I want you to know that I'm genuinely leaning in to have this move forward. So if you know you can't see that I'm actually relaxed and we're going to talk about this. So again, it's just framing and filling in some of those pieces of information yeah. and recognizing that they're missing. So that is so important that you know you have to make an extra effort to fill that in um, because you don't have the same cues in terms of body language or you may have some but you really don't see all of it. Um so that's really an important one. And I know on top of so many people's mind, because things have changed over the last few years. It's interesting too, in the, middle, in the middle of the pandemic, I had a lot of leaders saying, I got people who won't turn on their video. Like, how do you, how do you get people to turn on your video? And I said, well, request it, but then explain why. That the communication and the connectivity is hard enough remotely that without being able to get some sense of body language and be able to get some sense of visual, we're going to have more miscommunication and, and we're going to have more breakdowns and projects than if we were to actually see each other. So it isn't just me being like, oh, are, are you working? Are you truly present? I'm worried that you're like, you're heating your coffee in the microwave. No, 
This is about you showing up fully present because your presence increases our communication and connectivity. Great. Perfect. So as we, as I look to close, because I know um, you've been so generous with your time, I thought, well, for I'd love me. for you to share with the viewers. Can you share, you know, what, what do you do besides having interviews with me? <laughs> and, you know, how could someone reach out to you um, in t- if they wanted to get in touch with you? So both oh, of those thanks, things would be great. That's very generous of you to ask. It's really easy. So you can go to Amy K, A-M-Y-K, at amyk.com. So amyk.com is you can you can email me, you can get a hold of me at our amyk.com website. You can go to she gets it.com. She gets it is for our women leaders. But I am either speaking on stage, I'm a keynote speaker, I'm a corporate trainer. We have all kinds of sales training programs that we have here called our iconic inner circle. And we also have our leadership programs, our masterminds for women leaders. So there's lots of ways to play, including just joining our community, which is full of free tools. So if you're looking to get a tool from me every single week or a little bit of insight, you can join our community and just come play in our sandbox. And they're so fun. (laughs) So I highly recommend it. And you're on, there's tons of YouTube videos. There's a lot of things having you speaking. So it's really wonderful. Oh, thank you. That means a lot. Thank you. So as we close, there is actually a quote from your website, which I love. And it's, life happens one conversation at a time. So a big thank you, Amy K, for your wisdom, for your humor, for your inspiration. This is the stuff that growth is made of. Oh, thank you so much. From my heart to yours, Margaret Hugs. Thank you. I joined Vistage because I, I run a, a, a reasonably sized company, but I, I don't have a peer group available to me for advice or to um, really turn to when I have uh, issues. And in many ways, I found myself in a little bit of a rut, um, you know, lacking inspiration. So uh, the opportunity to join Vistage really opened this uh, access to um, a group of people um, and a team that I could really learn from and share ideas with and, and, uh, you know, gain inspiration to um, really develop further in my uh, career. So the reason that I joined Vistage um, was to explore uh, peer level relationships. I had been looking for coaches over time as I'm moving more into executive positions. Um, I really was looking for not just a singular coach, um, but the team structure. And that is why I joined. And quite frankly, I spent time with the the head and chair of our group as we were onboarding, and it became more and more evident that the value that I was hoping for um, could at least start with that membership. I joined Visage so that I could learn and grow as a leader by being part of a peer group and have an experienced chair to learn from. I joined Visage because I wanted to utilize additional resources to help me achieve my goals in business. And I believe that joining a group of other professionals and having a leader who has experience in aspects of business that I don't would be of great benefit to me. Uh, I joined Vistage because I was looking for a group of people, um, my peers that I can um, speak with, uh, with transparency um, and, and seek their advice. I mean, we all have blind spots and the people that we work with might have the same exact blind spots that we have. Plus, sometimes you just don't want to discuss certain items that are on your mind with the people that you're close to and you're working with every day. So it's always good. I find it refreshing to tell somebody something just cold, right? So uh, they don't really know anything about the topic. About your topic. And it's always amazing to me the kind of feedback that they get, the astuteness of it and uh, the, the things that I personally missed and, and it comes back to me. And it's, I find it very helpful. The one-on-ones with Margaret have been really invaluable. Margaret is an incredibly experienced, um, knowledgeable manager, consultant, essentially. And to have an access to somebody like Margaret with the the wealth of knowledge that she has about a range of industries has been really invaluable for me. Um, I just wouldn't otherwise have that access. 
Um, so I really look forward to my meetings with Margaret. Um, what's been really impressive about um, meeting with Margaret on one on one is how quickly she's come to grips with my business, um, considering she's not here day to day, and also how she's uh, got to understand the strengths and weaknesses of many of my my key reports, um, which has been really great for me. So as I consider consider um, different approaches to different problems, Margaret understands the players in, in who have to make things happen. So uh, I really look forward to those meetings. They've been really, really helpful for me. They're a great way to uh, follow up on our monthly meetings uh, where I can kind of clarify some of the things I've learned after having a week or two maybe of considering what we had talked about um, and just a further chance to uh, just really drill down on some of the things that we've been working on. But the, uh, the meetings with, with Margaret 101 have been really great. So um, as you know, we also have one-on-ones with our Vistage chair. Um, the one-on-ones are also an extension, right? Because now we've, we've had our, our group and we have that comfort zone. So that is a very nice bridge into the one-on-ones because quite frankly, when you're in a group of many folks, you wanna be respectful of others' time. So it's nice to have that personalized moment. Um, I would say, you know, in particular with Margaret, as much as sometimes I'd love to get the answer from Margaret with all of her experience, and she I'm sure has good views on what it would be, we spend more time trying to answer the question as to what's important to me. Um, so I'm really gaining a lot of new thinking tools that I, even if I'm not on the phone with Margaret or on with colleagues, I'm processing my own issues, thinking about it more from uh, a self-reflection of what, why am I, why am I having this issue? Um, what would Margaret say, <laughs> which is not a bad thing, but what would, she, or what would she ask me to think about? So it's really a powerful part of the overall Vistage experience. My one-to-ones with Margaret are sometimes the highlight of my week. Margaret is such a valuable resource. She's not only there for you when you have your meeting, but if something immediate comes up, she's always willing to talk. Most recently, about a month ago, I needed to check in on something that was happening at work that was very critical. And I reached out to her to just say, hey, can I put this on your radar for the next time we meet? And she said, do you have an opportunity to connect today? Because I can talk about this right now. I just really appreciate that time and space with her. So the one-on-ones with the Vistage chair are excellent because one of the many benefits uh, is that level of accountability. So in addition to getting the benefit of someone who has experience in aspects of business that I don't, or who has, a, who has a accomplished and executed on objectives uh, that I want to, that I've yet to in, in the course of my business, that's great. And then, as I say, you have the accountability of somebody who's going back with you over what was supposed to be uh, worked on, what were your goals, et cetera, et cetera. And so my, uh, my Vistage chair, Margaret, uh, she's great. I, uh, you know, I met her. It, it's funny, like we all get these uh, emails um, from different uh, companies reaching out to you, trying to market something. And I would say I ignore 99% of them. I don't know why that one piqued my interest. So I normally don't respond or I respond politely saying no, thank you. But uh, I reach out to Margaret and I'm really glad I did. Uh, she gets it. She's a pro. She's you know been in the business. She's been at a very high level. And um, I always find my conversations with her very helpful. I can speak honestly and openly. And she always guides me in a, in a good way to what my next steps should be. So let me tell you a little about issue processing and what it means to me. Um, you know, interesting, when I first heard it, I had a perception of what issue processing might be about. And what it really turns out to be is more of a, of, of, of looking into ourselves with the help of the team to truly identify what the issue is. And in the five or six now that issue processing moments that we've gone through with the various team members, we've never ended the issue identification process with the issue that the team member brought up initially. So it becomes one of self-reflection 
And then there's also accountability um, and having a partner to spend time thinking about it. So it's not one and done. It's really an ongoing process of learning. And because of, as I mentioned, with the culture and the openness, um, we really get into the weeds on some of the issues and even things that become slightly uncomfortable because people are perceiving an issue. But really, I've noticed that many of the issues, we control that outcome. So I love the process. It's not it's named appropriately, but it's very different than what I initially thought it was going to be in a much more meaningful way. Issue processing is an opportunity for each core group member to bring a challenge to the team. When we meet, we discuss what the issue is, and then we get to push each other's thinking. One of the things we do is consider, is that really the question or the problem that we want to be exploring? And once we settle on what that really is, we have an opportunity to provide some potential solutions to try out. And then the owner of the issue gets an accountability partner so that as they're going to try those solutions out, they have someone to connect with and check in with about how that's going. So issue processing at Vistage is essentially a circumstance where an individual in the group identifies an issue that they're uh, uh, attempting to deal with in their business. And the leader of the group structures the explanation of what that issue is in a certain way to make it very actionable and understandable for the other members of the group. Then once that part is complete, the other members of the group offer additional interpretations, understandings, with the ultimate purpose of narrowing down the issue into an actionable, and essentially an action point that you can work towards and measure and, and report back on at the next meeting. So for me, issue processing means that there's something that I'm struggling, for me personally, it's something that I'm struggling with and, and the answer is not quite clear. So it's, it's an issue that, you know, uh, I'm, I'm troubled with. I've been thinking about it. Um, maybe I arrived at a solution, maybe I haven't. Uh, but if I arrived at a solution, maybe I'm not really sure it's the right one. And it's always good to, uh, you know, state that issue. Um, and then sometimes, well, not sometimes, you get uh, kind of to restate the issue based on questions that you're asked by the other members of the group. So maybe your issue, you're thinking of it one way, but really the root cause of it is something completely different. Uh, once we figure out what the root cause and how to state that issue, uh, then we go around the table and uh, the, the different members of the group, uh, you know, give suggestions and ideas. And then you narrow those down to the ones with the highest payoff. And, and then after that, there is uh, accountability. You're assigned an accountability partner and uh, you'd have to come back and say, I've done those things. And that, that was what, uh, what happened as a result of it. Time commitment with Vistage is, um, it's definitely significant. No question, it, take, it, is a, it is a commitment of time, but it's a really well, well, uh, it's really well worth the time because the payback, I, in my opinion, far exceeds the uh, time you spend, if you like, at the, the monthly meetings or the one-on-ones. Um, you know, when you're in a business, it's very easy to, you know, fill up all your time, come into the office and, you know, be busy constantly and, you know, just by virtue of being in the office. But I found that, the, the time away from the office in an environment where you're, you're with people who are, you know, similarly looking for, uh, in, you know, guidance or inspiration or, or support. Um, just that time away gives you time to reflect on, on, on what's going on at, at the office and what's going on with the business and really learn um, and be inspired. And, and I find myself going back to the, um, to the office, to the business, full of new ideas um, that I other, otherwise wouldn't have. Uh, and, and perhaps, you know, about to move in a completely different direction than I might have otherwise had. So while, as I said, it's it's definitely, you know, a commitment of time, it's really great. It's, it's a really great way to spend your time um, that perhaps otherwise you would just be chewed up by the, the day-to-day things that you work on, um, you know, anyway. So, um, yeah, time well spent. So so one of my hesitations when uh, I originally joined was the time commitment. 
Um, we're all very busy. We put things off, even in our own personal lives. And I have to say that the time commitment, just on the face of it, is not overwhelming. It's a, it's a few hours a month, uh, one day every couple of months, an hour long phone call here or there. But because of the learning that's taking place during our sessions and as we're getting to know one another and thinking and learning about being more efficient, I have been saving an enormous amount of time in the other areas of my life, specifically at work. Um, I was really focused on doing a lot of the day to day and thinking about how to shed some of those. And with the tools that the team and with Margaret on the one on ones gave me, I was able to probably cut 20 hours a week out of my 60 hour work week um, to focus my efforts more on more strategic and coaching, even on my side of things. So uh, there is a time commitment, um, but it's really about the improvement in your overall time spend. So I'd say there's a perception to that, that after two months, I realized was was not a reality. The value is enormous. I would tell another executive about making the time that I think learning, you know, if, if you're at a point in your career where you own your business, you're the CEO, you know, you've, you've gotten to a, a place, whatever that is, where you know that you want to move forward and get to another level. I think education and information is a huge part of that. So the time commitment in just a very practical sense is I think one meeting a month in person, which, you know, essentially seven, eight hours. And then the one-on-one -on -one meeting, which can be scheduled at your convenience. And that's it. I don't think it's a big time commitment because any other time that is allocated uh, to these endeavors uh, is in pursuit of, of, of objectives that are directly related to your business. So it's not time away from anything. It's in it's actually in concert with what you're trying to do anyhow. So I think it's a relatively extremely manageable time commitment. Yeah, the other thing about uh, the hesitation of joining Bistage was uh, the, the time frame that it would take, right? Because, you know, every once in a while you have and, uh, listening to someone else state their issue, trying to help them with it. And we all have companies to run. We all have a lot of demands on our time. Uh, for me, a lot of the demands on my time are not really meetings that I have control over. It's something someone else said. So I was always, uh, in the beginning, I was hesitant because I, I didn't think I could make every meeting, just not because I don't want to, because I couldn't, because someone dropped something else on my calendar that I had to be part of. But, but even with that, even if you miss something, I think the follow-up is uh, you, know, you get the recordings of uh, a presentation, or you get the follow-up material like a book or something like that. So, I, you know, I found it, I, I can, I mean, we all juggle a lot of priorities and I find that I'm able to juggle um, my commitment to be part of a group and be present and contributing uh, with the other commitments in, in my life. I, you know, I do miss some meetings, but uh, I pick up right where we left off uh, at the next meeting. The biggest benefit of becoming a member of Vistage for me um, has been that it's, it's really got me out of a rut. I feel that I've been really inspired. I've been really energized um, by being in a group that, you know, you j j just by virtue of being with this really talented group of people, they've really inspired me to to raise my game essentially, and that I, you know, and, and I've been my eyes have been open to a whole range of of. Um, concepts and ideas and approaches that I didn't know even existed and, I, and you don't know what you don't know so for me it's it's really uh set me on I think on a on a on a, on a new path and I, and I feel myself really energized and excited about uh learning more and I feel like my journey has only recently begun but that I can already see the contours of um my future, you know, pre, you know, director <laughs> management style, uh, you know, developing as we, uh, as uh, you know, with every week passing week. So I would say that um, as becoming a member, the biggest aha that I that I had was, and this is a little bit personal. First, for me to be able to feel comfortable to speak up 
just to be able to, to talk to, and it comes really from the folks being really peers. Um, I wasn't sure how I would feel about speaking about private thoughts and things like that. The other aha uh -huh was everyone equally seemed un a bit uncomfortable at first. It's a, it's a building of a relationship, but I think we've all gotten to the same place and the level at which people are, the team, at least our group, is comfortable sharing even very personal things in some cases, because we obviously go through the health and, you know, and then our work and we rate everything. So some personal things come up. Um, that was my aha, is that how are you going to really get to a place with five or six individuals you've never met in your life and get to the core of the things that you think about in your own mind? So for me, that was the biggest aha. I would say the biggest benefit of becoming a member is I've received two or three highly actionable insights that I have to assume I would not have come to on my own. And you can never truly quantify the value of that. So, I mean, you know, I, I could be specific on it, but it's, it's, it's just in a, it's just in a few different areas of business, whether it's um, it really doesn't matter what kind you get a few insights, you get a few actionable uh, points of reference that can make a big difference in the business. And I've had that. So that's been quite beneficial. You know, I mean, I, I was in the beginning, I wasn't sure because it's it, sometimes like you talk to people you know, in, in our industry. If I talk to someone who's a competitor where they're not, they may not be willing to help me with all they've got, all their ideas, because we're competing, right? We could be friends, but we're also competing. But I wasn't sure, like, people in different industries, my, my biggest hesitation is we're, we're not making widgets. We're, we're providing a professional service. I'm not selling anything other than our thought process and our expertise. So I wasn't sure, like, the, you know, being part of the group uh, that they would get what I was struggling with or I would get what, what they were struggling with. But, but I think the issues are pretty universal. Um, yeah, we all struggle with the same things, no, no matter really what the industry or what the you know, profession that you're in. Once you have that much responsibility on your shoulder and other people's jobs are dependent on you and the growth of a company is dependent on you, I think you tend to struggle with the same type of issues, regardless of the industry you're in. But I'm glad I I, I did at the end because uh, it, even though I'm talking to people from different industries, I, I think the there's a lot of commonality and it's very helpful to me, and I, I think it's very helpful to them as well. I hope you found this session interesting and insightful. The leadership qualities I'm looking for in my members are those who are committed to a growth mindset, personally and professionally, willing to share ideas, receive feedback, and take action all in the spirit of making better decisions, and leaders who want to live their values. Also, Vistage provides an opportunity to build meaningful connections. We work hard, but we also have a lot of fun. Vistage is a game changer for people who want to build their business, and build a better version of themselves. This is the stuff that growth is made of. Thank you for participating. I'd love to get on a Zoom call to learn more about you and your business and explore if Vistage and my group could be a good fit for you. You can book a call with me by using the link listed in the summary, and I look forward to speaking.